you want to follow along. Um, modules. These break code down into mo manageable, uh, easy to read chunks. Uh, they are used to compose large, complex applications uh, without complicating your brain. And there are over 100,000 of them uh, with open source licenses available. Paul, give me a second. <laughs> I got this. I got available uh, for you to require in your application. There. We're all good. So. So modularity in code writing was given a, a real first class treatment with Node. Um, Node had the benefit of being very community driven from, uh, from, the, from the start. So kind of like slow baked, people figured out nice ways to do things. So um, dependency management and modularity um, kind of going hand in hand in this case. Um, most of your dependencies will be modules. Um, uh, in the sense that you know you're requiring, you know you're downloading the packages from somewhere else, um, but you also write your applications in the, in this modular pattern. You can write, you'll write local modules, um, and I'll sh and we'll, we'll look at that too. Most of you are, are already familiar with npm. Um, let's just go to the npm website. Uh, npm.org is going to forward us now to the .com. Oh look. Is a friend browser fine? So, how many people have used this website? It's new. Yeah, this is the this is the new version npm, which is an Oakland company, um, and is the now the sort of corporate uh, parent of the open source project. Um, yeah, they 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 went they went real time, big time, whatever you want to call it. Um, but it's you know it's a great place to, to, to look for to look for modules so and to um, you know it's like it's literally going to the library uh, somewhere over here I say uh, npm is a library and it's filled with modules uh, a, a galore of open source modules await your eager research so. Uh, Open source is is awesome. Uh, it's like the public library, um, and npm is just a really good repository for for open source, like GitHub is, uh, but npm specifically for Node uh, applications. Um, and when you you know start, when you really you know get with the flow of of writing your applications in this in this way. Uh, much of your code writing is research about open source modules because you don't want to write that code when somebody else has already done it. And, or if you can't do it in the first place. Like there's plenty of libraries, you know, it's beyond me. You know, um, so. And it's great that way because it's much easier than writing code. Uh, let's see. Right, so when your application calls for some specific task, it is usually best to see if somebody else has written a module for it. Does anybody have uh, any like good like queries for npm that we could? Anybody got like a? Oh, I could use a module that does something. So modules are basically tiny little applications. They might do something. As you've seen, you know they handle they handle a lot of uh, native functions. The FS. A clock timer. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Clock timer. Flexible JavaScript timers. A flip countdown. It's a jQuery clock timer. I don't know what that is. A grunt timer. A grunt timer. I think that uh, a grunt timer is like every interval, it's like, <laughs> 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 
Um, so here's a here's a MIDI clock, which is uh, which is actually probably pretty. I, I write programs with MIDI, and MIDI is um, is like really arcane, and um, has special ways of doing timing because the timing changes, the clock changes. So now somebody has written a uh, MIDI clock. That's pretty cool. I'll take a look at that later. Grunt timer? Oh, yeah. No, that's not what it, no. Grunt is actually a, um, it's about as good as what I said, but uh, it's actually meant for, it's about, it's for other things, but I, we don't, we can't get into it because I don't know anything about it. Um, uh, but you might also find like, um, like uh, HR timers. Uh, Node provides high resolution time in its uh, in in its API. So um, I've also got right here the um, Node API open, um, uh, something I continually reference. Uh, to me, the programming is is definitely a, a, just a ton of reference because it's it's um, not the kind of stuff I want to remember rem rem memorize over and over again. So, you know, I'm constantly hitting up API docs, um, but uh, there's a global, there's a high resolution timer in here um, that's built into Node. Um, it's a module uh, because Node's built-in things are modules, as you guys are witnessing with, you know, the learning Node things and such. Um, so, but high resolution timer in Node gives you timing down to the uh, megasecond or something like that, or I don't know. The next thousand after milliseconds in more pre in higher precision. No. Can we know what that is? Nano. Nanoseconds. There we go. Yeah. So it gives you timing in nanoseconds. And uh, like I have a module called Since When that um, does fancy fancy things with it. So. Um, it has a high resolution, you, you set a timer, and you can always call since begin to see how long it's been since you started it, since last, since the last time you checked. So if you were doing like a loop, you can be like, oh, since last time, how many times has it, uh, you know, how, how long has it been? So you might be doing a loop, that might be, that might be helpful. And then it's got a, a method called every, which is every nanos, amount of nanoseconds do a function and that's exactly like set time out or set interval, um, but it's for high resolution timing. Um, so you know, you, you the uh, it's 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 a little it is a little it is a lot like going to the library uh, and and being like this search is you know there's just so much to search through, um, and you know you just have to read a lot of. You're going to end up reading a lot of docs, trying to find a module that works for you. Sometimes you'll find something that like doesn't quite work for you, and you'll be like, "Well, let's look at it," and you'll learn something, and then maybe you'll like fork it and just write your, you know, like change it a little bit so that it works for you. Um, so if we have a program, when you're researching the module, is there something you're looking for in terms of like gauging the quality, like whether it's like well maintained or actually does what it says it does? Yeah, so um, this is a this is actually uh, an issue that NPM, the company, is trying to solve. Um, and and uh, they actually did a little survey recently. They wanted to know what people what people liked to see in that. And the the consensus was that people who had been you know doing the node thing for a while um, looked for the authors, who was the author of this module, who are the maintainers of this module. Um, and that um, people uh, fresh to it uh, go by download count. So those things are available uh, right here. So Commander, I don't know why why that came up in their search, but um, Commander was downloaded a lot. And mine was only downloaded 17 times in the past week. And um, I'll see here's an async one for handling uh, Stuff that's a that's a really popular one. I met that guy who wrote that, Caitlin something or other. Um, and they're not even saying who wrote it now. They're not even showing. 
So, I don't know. I troll them, NPM, because they're our friends. And, uh, and I don't know. I want you know, I can't even see it now. But if you look on that, you know, if you go into, you know, whatever. Because my, my resolution is so big, or whatever. So, here, you can see who, who wrote it. Um, oftentimes, it's best to go to the, or it's good to go to the actual GitHub repository. Most of them have a repository in GitHub. Um, you'll see the same, the same, the same docs, um, but you can also get into the code if you want to take a look at the code. Sorry, can you address um, licensing and what we need to look out for, or not worry about it or not worry about it? Yeah, um, I just don't worry about it <laughs> because I mean people are really nitpicky about their open source licenses, and I feel like if people are just like cool with it, it you know this whole licensing nonsense will just go away eventually and it doesn't matter if you've chosen BSD or MIT or whatever, whatever. That said, I don't know, NP NPM uh, uh, has, ha um, recommends one that I never heard of that's kind of new, I guess. They used to be MIT, James, do you know? <laughs> yeah, they're probably pretty uppity about that stuff in Europe too. As you can, as we know, we don't really, you know, we, we, we're suckers for all kinds of contracts we don't read around here. Uh, what's your favorite license? So um, that means with the module, you'll probably want to look for BSD, ISC, MIT, and possibly. Uh, There's also like public domain, which is like completely permissible. Public domain. And um, WTFPL, like basically the same thing. You probably guess what that is, WTFPL. <laughs> <laughs> the what the fuck public license. Yeah. So, uh, but you wanted to avoid copy left. Um, yeah, for libraries. Um, for libraries. Videos. Anybody who's, you know, anybody who's publishing modules to NPM that are not using permissive open source licenses, um, I mean, I don't even know if anybody is, but if they, if they get found, they'll probably, you know, get dragged through the cyber streets. Hmm. Um, and NPM is now offering people uh, the ability to publish their own private, mod, you know, proprietary modules in the same way. Um, I have personally used NPM uh, as like one of my primary, you know, re one of my primary publishing points. I published NPM not as much as James does, but uh, you know, I published last, you know, over the past several years, I've published mainly to Twitter and NPM and GitHub. But mm -hmm. GitHub's really just kind of like my backup. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. What is the funniest thing that's ever been uploaded to NPM? The funniest thing that has ever been uploaded to NPM. Well, there is. Um, I know. Yeah, I know you can download a console in the NCAT. I think. No. <laughs> uh, there was one that was published and then de and then forcefully depublished by the, uh, the the occasionally ruling hand of NPM, Isaac, and this was called Hoarders, which was a module that required, as a dependency for itself, thousands upon thousands of other modules, <laughs> and NPM couldn't handle it. I don't know, I'm not sure where the NANCAT one is, but you can, yeah, we'll move on. So. I have a question. Yes. As you, how do you decide whether you're just going to build it yourself or use somebody's work? Um, depends on, 
depends on depends on the person really. Um, I really go to great lengths to try to find it written somewhere else first. Um, if only because I mean I can always I can always like hack it you know I can always be like okay well this kind of works um, but this just doesn't work quite how I need it to so I can always very easily cruise into the source and, and do something and do something with it. Um, so depends on your style. There's a lot of there's definitely a lot of duplication in mm -hmm. in, in there, um, and there's also like competing. There's also things that like kind of don't use npm right using npm so like you'll these are modules that like you'll have to download other things to use I don't know um, so yeah you kind of have to do a little dedupe yourself when you're looking at them if it's something simple so often you know you, you, you could probably tell if it's like uh, if it seems like it's a common thing you know if it has something to do with HTTP servers um, you know, you're going to find gobs of modules for them because HTTP servers are like the bread of Node, um, and streams are the butter. And uh, so, common things are going to find you're going to find there. Um, but you'll see as you compose your applications, you're going to write a bunch of modules, but they're just going to live in your directory, and that's that. Um, because essentially, everything you write is a module um, when you're writing Node code. So the other side of that is when? Do, how do you decide when you're going to publish? Um, um, definitely, a, a lot of t so sometimes when I'm writing like an application or even a module, like I think I'm writing a module, or maybe I'm writing an actual app, um, I'll start writing something within the app or the module itself that seems like it should move out, and so it's a good idea to be like, okay, this, you know, I'm going to move this out now, finish it now, publish it, so that I don't, you know have to change the code I'm working on now when I do finally get around to publishing this. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, you just kinda, you'll just kind of know based on what the, li what the library itself does, whether or not you'll repeat it. A lot of my libraries are kind of, they kind of work on some of the same stuff. Uh, they kind of work together in a lot of ways, so it's pretty easy for me to tell when I need, a, when it's time to write a new module. Sometimes I plan them. I know when I know, like, oh, I'm going to need a module that can do this type of calculation or whatever. Um, so, does that answer? Yeah. Any other questions? Let's see. So, so the modules that make up the core of Node uh, can be found on the API, if you haven't already looked. Um, these are all modules, just like the ones published to NPM, but they're built into Node. Uh, many of them are very useful. Uh, you build your servers with the HTTP module. You can parse query strings, which are a common thing um, when you're doing web development. Stream, you know, there's stream and event modules that you'll end up using. So um, it's always been arguable which one of these, how, what, it, what, what should be core and what shouldn't be core, but this is what we have, and it's fine. Um, but the point is that you just use them exactly like other libraries, like other modules. Let's look at those modules. That's what we did. Did some searches. Okay, so let's do some let's do some module writing. So I'll just write a basic one. Um, So modules give you a way to uh, um, so you, I know people deal with like uh, uh, spaghetti code or like callbacks, excessive callbacks and things like that. When you start breaking apart your applications into modules, um, you'll find that each module maybe only has to handle maybe one callback instead of nests upon nests of them. Um, and uh, there's a little magic to it. Each module kind of has its own exists in its own place, its own closure. So you can define things within your module that no other part of your program will see, only your module. Um, this is kind of uh, this is kind of like public and private code uh, for like C, I guess. I don't know. I don't really know C very well. But um, so the the way you make a module 
is with module.exports. This is just something you have to, this is just something, you know, take it in, it's how you do it. Module.exports. It doesn't have to be a function, I'm writing this one to be a function right now, but this is how you do it. Module.exports, it's just what happened, uh, it needs no explanation, it's just how you do it. When you run node on it, node's gonna, you know, run the module. It actually defines uh, what happens is your module will get loaded up into the into the system, and um, Node creates a little environment for your module, and it defines module export, and that's the thing it's going to pass on to somebody to somebody to some part of your application um, or somebody using your module. Uh, that's what it's going to pass to them. Uh, so, module exports. That's how you do it. Um, so we'll see here. So, um, what you can see here is this is the this is a, this is this would be the program I'm going to write you know call Node on, and it's requiring that module. Um, you have uh, oh you you, you oh, let me go back into that. You um, have seen you know relative file path stuff um, in these lessons and probably in the Node School stuff. Uh, so that's basically how you write a module with your program. It's just that easy. Um, if you're requiring a module from, uh, well, you've required other modules, right? Has anybody not required a module? Not yet? Okay. We'll get to it. <laughs> um, but, you know, but what that looks like, you know, you guys, oops. That looks like, um, this, um, and if you were, say, var, um, timer equals require since when. That was, oh, you know what? So let's just look at this right here. So I wrote that other module. In, in, in this application, I've defined some things. I've defined FS as require FS. I'm just doing that to show you. You guys know that's a built-in. Um, no problem there. It's gonna, I'm going to have access to the file system through that module. Timer, require since when. Um, that's a public module. That's one that's published to NPM. I don't know if I have it actually installed here. Um, and then right here is the one that I defined as module, which is the local module that I just wrote that you guys saw, saw me write. Uh, and I'm using the uh, relative file path to tell require where it is. Um, so while we're here, we're looking at require. Require is just the opposite end of module.exports. Just take it in. That's how it works. Um, what happens is whatever you've exported becomes that. 
So that's why sometimes you'll see like, um, sometimes people will put like, well they'll just, they don't want the whole module. They'll just be like, oh I just want create write stream. What that is doing is the, the FS module returns a bunch of methods. Uh, looking at files, creating write streams, read streams, doing stats, looks, look up some files, things like that. So uh, oftentimes you'll see somebody do something like this and it's like, what they're basically saying is I only want the create write stream part of that. They'll have no, no other access to the rest of it and it's really just like a, a shortcut. So that's what you're seeing when you see something like that. Johnny, yeah. when you do a require, do you actually get uh, everything that's in FS loaded into your program space? Yeah. Um, and you might even get it. Do you, do you know if you get it loaded uh, several times if you load it across several modules? Um, you get the same references. So it's so a global reference. I think you just said FS is local to this program. Uh, yeah. And everything that comes with require FS is local. It's local to that FS variable. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so does that mean that I'm more specific? Which saves space? Well, you certainly save a lot of space. Um, So what did you mean by saving space? Well, I was getting the feeling that when you require FS, all FS is loaded. It's somewhere that carries weight. You know, so if you load less of it. No, it's always, always loaded. Okay. So then to Johnny's point, if you have five modules each requiring FS, there are five copies of FS. One copy. Okay. Um, there are ways to. Um, because who figures that out? Well, uh, uh, you just don't. You, this, you just don't. You don't want to have uh, uh, duplicates. You know, if you can. If you can. If you can. If, I, I think maybe even in the early days you did get duplicates. Or like I'm not sure, but. Um, that must be Node's responsibility. To yeah, for sure. Create pointers. Um, yeah, it's uh, uh, it's it's um, somewhat in, you know tries to be somewhat intelligent about it. Uh, oh right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there are. Uh, there are ways to, if you need different versions of the same module, uh, there is um, there is a way to do that. Um, is it with the add sign? about how uh, Node finds your modules when you require them. Um, it's going to do a search um, in your, in the first place it's going to look is in your Node modules folder, which uh, I don't think I have one yet. We'll see. Yeah, I don't, I don't have one. So the next place that it was gonna, it'll search is in uh, the directory above it, if that one has a Node modules folder. And it'll just go all the way up until until it can find it. If it can't find it, then probably this will happen. Let's see. 
cannot find module since when? Hasn't been installed yet. That runs. Doesn't do anything, but it runs. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes it does local. Sometimes it does. But, sometimes you, have a, but you have a node module in the project directory, so node saw that. I wouldn't do that only because it's more difficult than looking for things. I don't know why I have one in there. It probably just happened on accident. So you can see right there, I've got. Uh, a node modules directory in my big old project directory. Um, and that's where it installed. So installing, it's going to do the same thing. It's going to look to see if you have a local node modules folder. Put it in there. If you don't, it's going to put it somewhere else. This shouldn't happen really. Yeah. If you have a project, that should have its own node modules directory. Yeah, like this. So now I've got a node modules folder in my yeah. You should definitely have one in, in every in every uh, in every one. So now when I do, I can install since when again. It's going to check this local node modules folder. It's going to say it's not in there, and then it's going to go fetch it and put it in there. Yeah, there are global installs, um, but they're typically used for installing command line applications, because um, uh, that's typically what happens. You install with dash G. If you do npm dash G, um, install dash G, that's saying install it globally. Um, but you, you want to do that if you're, like for instance, Browserify. You download Browserify, you do dash G, and now you run Browserify on the command line. Um, I does. Yeah, you don't want to do that for like global usage inside of your different apps. You just want to use that for installing command line tools. Um, let me show you here then. Let's just work on this module. Okay, so what we have here is we're going to use that module that I wrote, that other module that I wrote, which does some arbitrary little stupid thing. Can anybody see? Can anybody know what that's going to happen when this if this gets called over and over and over again? Well, X is ten. It's going to be added to whatever Y value is each time it's called. Hmm. Right. So, uh, well, so what, what will happen to X every time, every time that this module function gets called? Well, yeah, it'll increase by Y. It's set to 10 in the other program, but it'll increase by Y, right? Y will come in, um, and X will be set, will be uh, incremented by whatever Y is. You guys are familiar with the incrementers like this? So now, let's see if this works. Got an error. Oh. 
o'clock. Uh-oh. Oh, right. <laughs> so, very often, um, even with my own modules, I forget how they work. <laughs> so I go back over to my docs. And then sometimes my docs are incomplete, so I just have to go look at my own code. But I think this says, uh, ah, yes. So when I'm using the every method, this is just some bad docs here. This is an old one I wrote. And I'm just praying that it's actually not buggy. Um, so uh, it gives me a, a, the, it, the, the callback function right here. I don't know if you guys can see this. The callback function, every nanosecond, it's going to run this function. That function is going to get called with a couple of arguments. One is called next tick and one is called interval. Interval <laughs> is going to tell us how long it's been since the other one did it. Next tick is a function that I have to call to tell it to continue. If I don't call next tick, it terminates. So it uh, seemed like a handy thing to have. Maybe I had to do it. Tick. So console log and then tick. You got a function. Uh-oh. Function. function T. Oh. Say that again? You can call variables from modules to your program. Um, you talking about the other module? You're talking about... Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, so, um, well the since when module uh, returns a constructor kind of function, and so that's why we have right here. So we have timer equals require since when. So now timer equals whatever module exported in the since when library. And, um, yeah, that's what module exports is. So, um, that's over here. So this was a uh, this one was just a, a silly little module. So this is an actual module. Um, if you if you if you wrote a little metadata file called package JSON and you create an npm account, you could then publish something like this to, to, to npm. And you know npm doesn't care if it's silly. Um, but here, this function module exports uh, module exports is what says this is what this module is exporting to require. So mo so uh, require and module exports are just like uh, opposite ends of each other. Um, so in this case, module exports um, a function. But you could uh, export an object. You could export a JSON. You could export um, a number. You can export anything. But typically, they're functions that do things. Uh, can you do multiple exports per module? You can, you can do, uh, you can tag on to exports, essentially. So you could be like module exports, Sorry, this one like that. Mm -hmm. Module exports is a object. So you can do it like this. It's not, you don't typically see that. Typically you'll see, uh, if you want to do something like that, um, then you'll have like, So, oops. What I'm doing here now is a is is a uh, is a function expression. Mm -hmm. And this one, if I did up here with var, it would be a function declaration. Um, they both make a function. Uh, the cool part about function expressions is that you can um, write them anywhere on the page, and they'll be loaded uh, before any of the code is run. Whereas Anything declared with var declarations happen in you know linear order from top to bottom. So you can't you can't reference something that has been declared with var until you've declared it. 
but this uh, optional way of declaring functions called a functional expression allows you to reference that function on before it's been declared, so to speak. And this is helpful because um, it makes it's a good way to com it's a it's a nice way to compose applications. You can be like you know somebody opens up now somebody looks at this code and they're like I want to know what's going on here. The first thing they see is module exports equals this, and they say okay know where that goes. They start looking at this, and then they can also, you know, then they'll start seeing, you know, how I, how I build my, Oh uh, yeah, I, I I mentioned that right. The um, like just doing like. So yeah, you could you could do, foo. And then. And then say we could put this one up here. It's just a no operation function. Mm -hmm. Um. Is that considered good practice or don't care or what? Don't care because module exports is just an object like any other JavaScript object. And so, you know, it's just like how you want to deal with it. Um, uh, depending on the, you know, it kind of depends on, I often do it, do something similar to this. Um, if, I, if, I, so if I have like a collection of, of uh, independent algorithms or something like that, mm -hmm. um, like I have, uh, So here's a funky way of doing things. Um, I did this um, just to be overly um, simple with my typing, a little less typing. So right away, I declare this variable, odds, and odds equals module exports. Module exports already exists. I'm just declaring another variable that points to it. Um, and I'm doing that so that later on, I can basically do that thing we we're seeing here, oh, I see. module exports. Foo bar. I'm basically doing that, but I just made, you know, I've just, you know, limited my keystrokes. So that's a legal way of doing things. And then you can see I used functional expressions to go below and define all of those. So instead of doing function declarations with var and um, sort of, then, then what would happen is before all of these, before all of those aws, sign, aws, saw, whatever, whatever, I'd have to done var sign equals function, var saw equals function, whatever. So instead I've done functional expressions and just put them all nice and neatly down at the bottom. It's totally a stylistic choice. There might be other reasons to do function declarations versus functional expressions, mm -hmm. um, and uh, but I don't know any of them. Okay. So um, now what do we have here? So now Fun fun is our new, is our active one. And we know what that's going to do. It's going to continually increment x, et cetera, et cetera. And then back over in Zindex, we have, hopefully this works. And oh, right. Does anybody know what I did, what, what my errors is? So we'll look at the code. It tells us right here on uh, JS line 9, it says index JS colon 9, that means line 9. So we'll go back into that down here at line 9. So module, remember we just messed up, we just changed it, right? So now we're using one of the methods on the export. So now, if my module's not buggy, No method fun fun. Oh, I changed it to foo. <laughs> right? See, this is where, you know, this happens, especially if you like.
try to be creative with you, with your with your names and stuff. Um, oftentimes you'll just you'll just do this. It'll take it'll take a little while to like get all your names right and make yourself happy. But until then, you know, just go with it. Um, I do recommend uh, using um, uh, descriptive variable names for your own sanity later on, because you'll go back and look at your old code, and you'll be like, you'll, so, it, from my personal experience, I'll, I'll, I'll be like, man, this, this algorithm is just getting so, so hairy, you know, I just, like, nest upon nest of variable declarations, and I start getting like, uh, I don't want to type anymore, and I'm just like, x, var x, var xx, var xy, you know, and, um, and, because, because somehow writing, shorter variable names means I'm writing better code or something. And then later on, I'll be like, oh, I cannot decipher this. I wish I had just used a descriptive variable name to let me know what I got going on here. Hmm. All right. Well, there it goes. So every milli that was every millisecond. So every millisecond it's updating because I did every million nanoseconds. So that should be... Another way to another way to represent this would be like this. So now that's every second. Oh, and just for you know, for fun actually, to see just how good, see how how well this works. Let's do like every. I don't know how many of that is going to be. So it's going to tell me the interval. Oh, wait, I need to know how many that's going to be. Oh, fuck. We'll just do every second. Right. So I'm just going to get rid of that. So this is letting us know just how accurate it has been in nanoseconds. I told it to update in console log every second uh, how long the interval between them was. Hmm. So as you can see, um, it stopped. But it was very accurate for a while. Those were nano. Those are nanoseconds. The interval. So a billion. You know, it's only been off by couple hundred thousand nanoseconds most of the time. I don't know why it stopped a lot. That's kind of weird. <sighs> what else? James, you think of anything else that should uh, start getting covered? Should cover? Well, um, questions? Any other questions? This could very well be a bug, so I was like trying to optimize it once, and I might have quit. Or it could be something else. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll and I'll try to document these too. Um, all of my stuff's been going into the same little repository. Um, so, what was happening in that program? Was it going through the event loop and, and the interval was where the event loop says that before it fired again? Is that why the difference? Um, the difference is just because um, the um, well, the truth is that the module is kind of like that particular method of the module, the one that does the interval on the on the nanosecond thing, um, is kind of a hack that actually does use um, set interval because there's just no other, there's no other there's a, there's no other way to really do it, um, or maybe set maybe use set timeouts, maybe use some set timeouts. Uh, the timing is never going to be, you know, perfectly accurate. Uh, if in or using set timeout and set interval um, in JavaScript, I don't know if you guys have seen this. Let's go to the seller. Uh, so you've got set timeout as a function, set interval as a function. Anybody not know what these are? These functions. Set interval, set timeout, timing functions, interval functions, built into JavaScript. So they're only they're only the they'll 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 never they'll never happen faster than you tell them to. Oh. They'll always happen slightly slower. 
I should play this. Um, there's lots of different ways to write loops. Uh, um, probably, I don't know if we'll, if we'll end up talking about it. I'll probably write about it, um, but just doing functions, loops, and iterators. Um, did you guys cover, probably cover that stuff in basics? Mm -hmm.